Great. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to each and every one of you for joining us at this important Chatham House Members Events webinar on race and politics. Um, the killing of George Floyd on 25th of May 2020 by a police officer in Minneapolis sparked protests across the US that have reverberated around the world and forced long overdue conversations on systemic racism. Racial prejudices are sustained by social, political and economic systems and structures that fail to accommodate and represent diverse voices. The ongoing BLM protests or Black Lives Matter have brought renewed focus onto laws, policies and practices that actively discriminate against people of color. And as societies are forced to confront these persistent and racist cultures and environments, does the current moment mark a significant shift in the global anti-racist movement? That'll be the topic of discussion today. And we are so lucky to be joined by two leaders in the anti-racist world, both of whom are very distinguished individuals who have actively campaigned and worked on this topic and have made active efforts to ensure that the lives of people of color, of, of, of black people are made easier through effective and, uh, and substantial changes to the way that our countries, our political systems and our institutions operate. We are very lucky to be joined by firstly, Dawn Butler MP. Um, she's a member of parliament for Brent Central um, of the Labour Party. She's worked as an equality and race officer at GMB Union, the trade union, and as an advisor to the Mayor of London. Dawn is also an honorary vice president of the British Youth Council and was chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Youth Affairs um, <clears throat> and was made a member of the Children's Schools and Family Select Committee. In 2008, she became assistant whip in the Commons before her work on youth led to Dawn being appointed as the Minister for Young Citizens and Youth Engagement at the Cabinet Office by Prime Minister at that time, Gordon Brown. Thank you for joining us, Dawn. Um, we are also joined by Dr. Kenetta Hammond Perry, who serves as the director of the Stephen Lawrence Research Centre at De Montfort University, where she is also a reader in history. Prior to her appointment at De Montfort, she was an associate professor of history and co-director of the African and African and African American Studies program at East Carolina University in the US. Dr. Perry received her bachelor's degree in history and political science at North Carolina Central University and obtained her doctorate in comparative black history at the Michigan State University, where she has been awarded with uh, research fellowships with the Carter G. Wooden Institute for African and African American Studies at the University of Virginia and Duke's University Department of History and the American Council for Learned Scol Societies. Um, I am very, very thankful to have both of you with us. Um, your introductions really shows uh, the, the merit that you both have to be speaking about such an important topic as this. Um, I, I find it poignant that we find ourselves, um, of course, a week removed from our centenary celebrations at Chatham House. Um, and I think it's a beautiful thing for us to be able to start our next century initiative, our next century's events with an event like this. And I hope we continue um, as we begin. On that note, um, I will pass it over to our first speaker, who will be Dawn Butler MP, to provide her opening remarks. Dawn, thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you, Yusuf, for that wonderful introduction. And you're right, it's a great sort of time to be having this debate and uh, congratulations to Chatham House for organizing it as one of their first after their uh, celebrating their centenary. Um, so I'm gonna quickly talk about how racism affects the political discourse. And people kind of say, uh, is there racism in politics? And if there is, can, you know, can we see it? Is it tangible? Is it uh, palpable? So I say this, that um, we have had state sanctioned discrimination for uh, pro probably for as long as politics ever existed. But now, now we're in this time where we're now seeing the manifestations of this state sanctioned discrimination. And I'll name a few areas. Um, Windrush scandal, Grenfell, the police, and COVID-19. So all of these areas highlight just how damaging and dangerous uh, state-sanctioned racism is in, in modern times. So we know that the Windrush scandal and the hostile environment was basically state-sanctioned discrimination. 
And people may feel uncomfortable with that term, but really I think we have gone past um, people feeling uncomfortable and what we need to go towards is people owning and understanding and then seeing what they can do and what role they can play in trying to dismantle the systemic racism that exists in society, in their own workplace and politically. We know that um, those people that have suffered from the hostile environment are in the main um, African Caribbean and are of a certain age. So if this had happened at any other, in any other country, uh, the UK would have sent people to that country to investigate what was happening if there was a state sanctioned discrimination as we have had and, and has manifested itself in the Windrush scandal. Grenfell. Grenfell uh, inquiry has restarted. It restarted last week. But this inquiry is not taken into consideration under its terms and conditions, uh, racism and class. Now, without taking those aspects into consideration, the inquiry will be incomplete. And it will also be on the wrong side of history. Because we have to question why there's a group of people in in a high rise estate who questioned why their homes were being covered in flammable material and yet still they were ignored. Why were their voices silenced? Why were their voices not taken into consideration? What was it that didn't allow their voices to be amplified and for that to be taken into consideration? And we saw the end result, the tragic end result um, of that. Uh, the police force. I mean, it is a well-known fact that um, black people get stopped and searched and young black men get stopped and searched at least 12 times more than their white counterpart. I mean, I talk about when I was um, about 13, 14 years old, my brother said to me, you know, Dawn, if you're ever in trouble, don't call the police, call us. We will protect you. Whereas we can't guarantee that the police will protect you. I mean, they actually said it a lot differently, but that is me saying it in in kind of palatable terms, but call them, don't call the police. And all these years later, there are still issues with the police. So we have to, we have to understand that systemic racism is not only real, it's damaging. And now we're at a point in time where it's what can we all do and how can people use their privilege to change? And COVID-19, um, COVID-19 and my constituency in Brent Central, we have a very high death rate. Um, and people have said to me, and I raise this on the floor of the House, the House of Commons, and people have said to me, oh, Dawn, you know, try and, people are trying to be clever. They said, oh, Dawn, you know, what are you trying to say that the virus is racist? And, you know, you have to take a deep breath and you have to understand that people are in their own way coming on their own journey. And I have to say, look, the virus isn't racist, but society is racist. And because of that racism, it has led to a disproportionate amount of deaths in um, African Caribbean and Asian, particularly men and, and women. And so I think the reason why we're having all these debates now and, and probably the reason why uh, people are now questioning uh, what they're actually seeing with their own eyes is because one, you can see it with your own eyes. The lynching of George Floyd for those eight minutes and 46 seconds, people saw that with their own eyes. And they couldn't explain it away. If you'd heard it from somebody else, they would have said, oh, yes, but he was being really aggressive. Oh, yes, but he had a gun. Oh, yes, but he had. But you couldn't explain that racism away. It was right there in front of your eyes, uh, eight minutes, 46 seconds. And the other thing is this, I think um, the pandemic has led us all to be more reflective. When you want to not think about something, you keep yourself busy. And actually, COVID-19 and uh, the pandemic has meant that our lives have been steadied and has been stilled for a while. And because it's been stilled for a while, we're now thinking about things and people are now thinking about things. And that is why when, um, and I'll end on this, um, I'm, I'm kind of optimistic in this moment because when you look at the people who have taken to the streets, uh, there are people who would have normally just as maybe have sat at home, but they've been sitting at home for weeks and months and they've seen this racism played out in front of their own very eyes. And they're now saying, 
or how comes I didn't see that before? How comes I didn't recognize that before? And now I need to do something about it. And that's why I'm optimistic about this moment in time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dawn, for those uh, for those great words. I think there's something there's so much to learn from exactly what you've said, and I think I find it particularly interesting. You mentioned the fact that people are now um, able to process much more than they were able to before the, the the pandemic. Life just moved on, I think, and and we've heard these names, whether it be Eric Garner, whether it be Sandra Bland, amongst others, where individuals have passed away, and then there's been upset, and people have moved on relatively quickly, but because of the pandemic everyone is to a certain extent stuck to just dwell over why these things are happening and uh, thank you so much for that in particular. Um, I will pass it on to Dr. Canetti, but to Dr. Canetta, but just before I do, I'll mention that of course this event is, is being recorded and is, is live streamed, which also means that you're able to tweet um, any thoughts you may have or any of the words of the speakers on Twitter using the hashtags CHEvents, and I'm sure many of the words that Dawn and Dr. Canetta um, say will be things that are poignant enough for you to share on your social media. Um, now passing it over to Dr. Canetta. Hi, thank you again for having me. It's, it's really an honor to, to be a part of this panel and, and in this discussion today. And I, I think I'll just sort of really pick up where, um, where Dawn left off in terms of thinking about what um, this moment makes possible. And I think, um, you know, there is something about the scale and scope of what we've seen in the last uh, couple of weeks that feels different or, you know, it feels like a moment of, of different kinds of possibility. And I do think the backdrop of COVID-19 and what that sets in motion in terms of, of what people are thinking about and what becomes more visible in the day to day that's always been there. Um, but there's a way in which um, the backdrop of COVID-19 brings all of that into really uh, clear focus. Um, so, you know, I was reading something uh, this morning, uh, an a interview with Naomi Klein, where she was sort of talking about even sort of in our day to day, the things that we touch, um, you know, is, is that that's something that we're relating to differently. We're thinking about where was this before I touched it? Um, and again, that's making us think about capitalism differently. So that's making us think about all sorts of different kinds of inequalities. We're thinking about the journey by which packages come to our house and the key workers that are involved in that. And I definitely think that's a, a, an important backdrop um, because I think it's where we sort of hear all the time that COVID-19 has magnified our ability to see pre-existing racial inequalities. I also think it's sort of magnified our ability to notice, um, to notice those things that have been for so often unspoken, um, disregarded or unthought about, um, but that were there all the time. I think COVID-19 has really heightened our collective senses in regard to how we notice day-to-day um, -day inequalities and how they're experienced, um, like racism, how racism is, is experienced. So again, that point about reflection, I think is so critical because I think the other piece about the reflection thing is that, that COVID-19 sets the backdrop for people to think about what wasn't working in terms of business as usual. What do we not want to return to? Um, you know, what, what was there that, that we don't want to go back to in terms of any kind of new normal? And people are raising that as a question. And I think um, you know, that has also sort of set the backdrop for some of the ways that people have, have been responsive to the ways in which we have been able to see and bear witness to um, really crimes against humanity, I would argue, in terms of what happened to, to George Floyd. So again, those things have been there, but our, our sensibility to sort of notice them, I think, has been a really big part of, of this moment. One of the things that I'll sort of talk a little bit about is, is sort of thinking about some of the parallels between the US and the UK. And, and I think, you know, in many ways they're parallel, but they're also just very much intertwined. Um, we share the same histories of colonialism and enslavement. Um, last year, there was a lot of conversation in the US about the year 1619 and what we make of it. But one of the things that, you know, I, I saw some of the media headlines in the UK and it was like, you can't divorce that from the fact that 1619 what was the US and if that's a starting point for thinking about race and racism in the US, um, it was a British colony at that time. And so in many ways, part of what we're seeing on both sides of the Atlantic is sort of um, the, the sort of continued legacy of British colonialism and a British imperial history of enslavement. And I think that's something that also sort of um, unites or sort of intertwines um, these moments as we're looking at them on both sides of the, um, both sides of the Atlantic. I also think one of the things that we're also seeing in terms of legacies is sort of 
the legacy of a kind of failed project of abolition that never really delivered a kind of full black freedom. Um, and I think that's another thing that we're seeing, um, you know, that the fact that abolition and the ending of slavery didn't do all the work that it needed to do to actually fully incorporate um, people of African descent or the formerly enslaved into the nation state. And I think that's one of the things that we're grappling with. So when we see in both nations, black people being overrepresented at every level of the criminal justice system. And again, this is the system that has a direct bearing on your experience of freedom in society. And then we also see that coupled with the underrepresentation of black people in positions of power and positions of influence um, in decision making in the public and private sector, you know, there's there's sort of you know a lot to be said about how the the genealogy of of both of those trajectories, both in the U.S. and in the U.K., is very much entangled with the kind of unfinished project of emancipation to some extent. Um, and so again, you know, kind of in, indulge me as a historian here. I think the history piece um, is really important in sort of you know really grappling with. Um, you know, what didn't happen historically and what needed to happen historically. And I think that's kind of what, what really leads me into sort of thinking about um, the political system and how we see um, public policy as a kind of uh, tool for racism and as a tool by which systematic um, and structural racism is made operative. Um, and I can think of, you know, just a couple of examples here. You know, I think we can think about public policy and political systems operating both by design um, in doing some of these things, but also in practice. And sort of one good example that I think that um, Don has already made mention to is if we think about things like the Windrush scandal, you know, ultimately that's something that was set in motion with a set of immigration and nationality policies from the 1960s that we're now seeing play out um, in this particular moment. And by design in 1962, if you go to those cabinet debates and if you go to um, you know, the policymakers who were designing that Commonwealth Immigration Act of 1962, you can see the discourse there that it's about restricting particular kinds of immigration um, into the, the British nation and sort of creating this bounded notion of British citizenship that's wrapped up in notions of whiteness and, and wrapped up in ways to sort of racialize and stigmatize certain people from accessing the benefits and the resources that come along with, um, with, with the category of citizenship. And that's one of the things that we're continuing to see play out. I think, you know, another piece that I think is important to note about how policy and the political structure works to, um, you know, operate racism is by its inaction. Um, one of the things that's striking to me about this moment is if we look at the PHE report on the disproportionality that we're seeing within COVID-19, this, this same report or this same information was available to us in 1980 with the Black report, which basically talked about the ways in which there's been since the, the, um, the establishment of the NHS in 1948, that basically we had been seeing this, this exacerbating health divide, these exacerbating health disparities. And part of what the Black Report does in the 1980s, it says that if we're going to tackle health inequalities, we have to be looking wider at the socioeconomic determinants of health. And we have to sort of take a wider lens. We have to think about things like increasing welfare benefits, abolishing child poverty, redistributing public resources, looking at quality um, housing for for uh, deprived communities. And that was echoed in 1997 with the Aikenson Report and the Marmot Report in, in 2010. And I'm wondering, you know, would we be thinking about Grenfell in the same way if we had actually, you know, actioned some of the things that, that, that were previously put on the table before? And I think that's why in this moment, you know, when government's response to, to what is happening is another report or another sort of set of explorations to kind of prove whether or not racism exists or prove whether, whether or not inequalities exist. In the case of the Metropolitan Police Department, this moment is demanding something much more. And um, it's demanding that questioning of why government has remained so inactive and sort of used reporting and using collection of data as a way to kind of um, obfuscate dealing with the real issues that are going to actually move um, 
progress towards sort of um, addressing uh, uh, systematic inequalities that structure um, certain kinds of racial um, disparities that we're seeing now, but again, that, that have already been there. We have the data in terms of knowing that, that that's there, so we don't need to sort of prove that anymore. And I think that's one of the things that I think is quite different. I think there is a, a wider appetite and a wider reckoning that those sorts of strategies that have been used by the political system are not are not going to hold weight. So I think, you know, things that were previously unimaginable or unthinkable are now on the table. And I do agree that this moment holds a lot of promise um, because of that, but it is about how we leverage the visibility of this moment to think about longstanding sustainable um, change. And that's not only in the UK, but I think globally. Thank you um, so much, Dr. Kanetta. I think it's uh, I think all the points you made as a historian there's a there's a huge benefit in your ability to recall in reality how modern day and present day problems and uh, are rooted in in reality in, in, in issues that could have been dealt with or were perpetrated on purpose from from decades ago. On the question that you raised at the end, or to a certain extent, the point you made regarding uh, the reframing of society, one of the bigger questions that we've that we've seen, or at least one of the biggest statements and requests from the Black Lives Matter movements globally has been a rethinking of the police, a reimagining of the police, sometimes phrased as defunding the police. Um, as, of course, the director of the Stephen Lawrence uh, Research Center, the McPherson Report is only 21 years old uh, as of this year. How do you can, you, can you speak towards where you feel those failings within institutions like the police exist and and whether you felt any of the any of the learnings that were provided to the police following the McPherson report have in, been implemented, or have things just begin to began to deteriorate even further? Yeah, I mean, I think McPherson is an interesting kind of benchmark for some of these conversations. I think on the one hand, there's a lot that was never sort of dealt with that McPherson was pointing us to. Particularly, I think one of the areas that, um, in terms of the work that we're doing at the Stephen Lawrence Research Center at De Montfort is to pay attention to the unfinished agenda regarding McPherson in, in, in relation to issues around education. Um, you know, it was, McPherson wasn't just about the police and it wasn't just a statement about um, institutional racism within um, policing, but it also was sort of making a bigger conversation about um, things around the curriculum that needed to be addressed. And that's definitely one of the areas that we're, um, we're very interested in. But I also think, you know, this, this particular, you know, moment that, that I'm sort of thinking through is I'm also thinking about how, you know, um, there are ways in which notions about abolishing the police and defunding the police are also sort of saying, you know, whereas McPherson was about how do we reform? Um, I actually think the conversations that we're entering into now are actually like, how do we actually tear it up and acknowledge that it from, from its inception, it was not necessarily built to deliver a kind of equal justice for everyone in society. And I think that's a really powerful proposition that we're, we're actually sort of saying, you know, we're, we're not just, I think Ethel Hirsch had a great piece that is sort of highlighting the ways in which what we're seeing is not the failing of, of the state or the failing of these different arms of the state, but they're actually doing what they're designed to do. They're doing what um, what the, 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 the laws behind them, you know, that, that, that are enabling them to do. And so how do we reappropriate resources? How do we reimagine questions around public safety? And I think those are really interesting questions that I think take us even further than what McPherson was, was trying to, to draw out. So I do think, you know, part of, of what we have to do is McPherson was a great benchmark and it introduced a kind of lexicon and a kind of public speak around the realities of institutional racism, particularly in British society. But I do think, again, we're, we're at another moment of reckoning with, you know, how do we actually, you know, take this to an even different level to deliver, you know, an even wider and, and, and imagine a more wider and expansive um, degree of justice for, um, for Black people in Britain, but also for, for any, you know, underserved or um, underrepresented community within any nation. And I think that's, that's the question that's, um, that's, you know, sort of at stake now. You know, thank you so much for that, Dr. Kanetta. Dawn, do you have anything to speak towards uh, that question or that area? I think um, exactly that. I, I agree with Dr. Kanetta, but I'll also say this. I mean, I do think the police 
force is operating as a force rather than operating as an establishment that is supposed to protect everybody equally. And the problem with Cressida Dick's response to institutional uh, racism is to talk about um, how she doesn't think that it is a useful term, um, but, it, but it is a factual term and in its reality, the police is still institutionally racist. So if your first reaction is to put up a defense, then you are defending an institutionally racist system. And so therefore you are not part of the problem. I mean, you're part of the problem, you're not part of the solution. And actually she should be striving to be part of the solution. So instead of saying, um, I don't find it um, a useful term, or if you want to describe it as such, what you're doing is you are putting the blame on the person that's being uh, discriminated against, rather than taking the responsibility as it is your job to do as the head of that organization. And this is what this is what you'll find in organizations that don't want to change. And where we have to move the dial, we have to move the dial to people who do want change in their organization. And if that isn't that person, then you need to find the person that wants change and will help to deliver change because it's absolutely vital because you know, this, is, this has been happening for decades and decades and decades. And we see it manifest itself now because we've got you know, the abundance of footage from people's phones, but there's so much more that happens and it has to change because if it doesn't change, I mean, it's a, it's a fundamental tenant of how our society works. And so it, it has to work and it has to change somehow. Well, thank you so much for that, um, Dawn. Um, and I, I invite, of course, our, our participants to ask questions in the Q&A box, but a question directly to yourself and I'll be using my chair's privilege. Um, Dawn, um, firstly, thank you for joining us. For those of you that are unaware that Dawn um, chose to close her constituency offices recently, just a couple of days ago, actually, because of racial threats made towards her staff. And I think it really, to a certain extent, is a manifestation of the, the difficulty you as, of course, a high profile politician, a, a black woman faces in your position. The racialized nature in which, whether it be the way you're covered, in the media, whether it be the way that the institution itself may react towards you when you are outspoken, is there anything you can speak towards that and, and, and tangible, um, whether it be solutions or, or ways that we can move forward so that the experience of generations to come after us aren't necessarily reflected in the one that you currently have? So, I mean, we do have to get to a point where we have um, fairness, uh, equality and equity. And we need to get to that point at that moment in time. At the moment, we haven't got to that point. So yes, every time I will speak out, I will be accused of I'll be accused of being racist myself because I am challenging racism. I'm being accused of not telling the truth when I'm telling the truth of the situation. And people will go to lengths to try and disprove what I'm saying rather than accepting that there's an issue and saying, well, how can it be dealt with? And this happens uh, not just to me, but to everybody um, of colour in every single organisation. And so it is how do we get to a point where instead of being defensive and trying to disprove the fact that somebody says, I didn't get a, I didn't get this promotion because of the colour of my skin or because I speak with a slight accent, saying, how can we change our organisation so that doesn't happen again? You know, there's certain things that, that can be done, like, you know, blind name recruitment, blind name grading on exams, all of those things can be done um, and, and are shown to have worked. But, um, but yeah, at the end of the day, the abuse was just too much for me to justify. I mean, there's other issues as well in my office that I've talked about, but the abuse was just too much for me to justify keeping a public office on the high street open because it wasn't just my welfare that was at risk and in danger, but my staff's welfare as well. And I can't protect them. I can't physically be there all the time to protect them. I can't protect them. And I wasn't going to put them at risk in that way. And so, and when people say, hey, well, you should be able to disagree. Of course, disagree with me all, all you like, all day long. I'll happily have a conversation, an argument, a discussion, whatever. But when you start to use threats, when you start to be racially abusive, when you start to insult, then no, I don't have to put up with that. And you know, people have got this impression that you know you have to listen to whatever. Free speech doesn't mean that you can talk to me any way that you like. And we need to start. We need to start having those conversations. <laughs>
No, completely. No, thank you so much, Dawn. Um, Dr. Kaneta, um, is there anything you have to speak towards, especially as someone who has uh, forged a successful career in academia, which uh, of course isn't the most diverse of, uh, of, of, of professions to, to be engaging in? Yeah, um, I mean, I guess, you know, I guess one of the, I mean, if, if we're thinking about academia, I do think, you know, if I'm just sort of staying in that lane, it, it is another, we are at, you know, this moment where universities, again, there was a big sort of, you know, a couple of weeks ago where universities were sort of, you know, putting out different kinds of statements. We're seeing all sorts of, I think, organizations sort of trying to sort of figure out what their stance is um, on these issues and what, you know, particularly in the case of my own institution, some of the conversation has been about, you know, really looking in the mirror um, you know, what do our boardrooms look like? You know, we have a, a at our at the university that I work at, um, it's a, it's a 54% Black and Asian student population there. Um, you know, so what does that mean in terms of the curriculum? What does that mean in terms of who's in the classroom? And, and one of the things I, I say all the time is like the debate about statues um, and that whole notion of like, what are we celebrating and what sorts of messages are we seeing, sending about what's important through a statue is the same sort of message that students are asking when they go through their whole British education or their university experience and never encounter a person of color in the classroom as a knowledge producer and as, as a person that is, is sort of sending a message about legitimate expertise. And so I think it is, you know, prompting a lot of different kinds of questions about what our organizations look like. But I do think the first step is really looking in the mirror and acknowledging, you know, where the the, the gaps are, where, you know, how do do we get to, did we get to a point where no one nerd noticed the lack of diversity in, in certain decision-making spaces in our organizations. And so I think, you know, that's one of the things as well that I think is sort of interesting about um, about this moment. And, and I think another thing too, is that we are speaking um, I think the, the, there's been a shift in the discourse, whereas previously conversations were just about diversity um, or the aspiration of inclusion. We're now saying, you know, what does structural racism look like? You know, is our institution, you know, how is institutional racism manifest in our institutions? We're looking at the data. We're seeing the lack of, of representation in certain spaces. And, I, and again, I, I still you know, I'm, I'm quite hopeful, um, you know, that, that, you know, that, that, that this provides an opportunity to link up a lot of conversations that have previously needed to happen. Lisa, can I say, it's, it's absolutely human nature to not want to interfere with something that benefits you. If things are going well for you, it's absolutely human nature to not want to trouble it because you're having such a good time that you, you don't want to upset the apple cart. You know, it's absolutely human nature to do that. It's, it's also human nature to have biases. We all have biases. But we have to get to a point where you're checking your own bias in a situation and seeing if, if you can cancel out part of your bias by, by recorrecting yourself. It takes a lot of effort. It's not something that's easy. It's something that, you know, you have to continually question and rehearse. And that's something that has to be done rather than, I mean, I have people who are the only uh, person of color in an organization giving me a call saying, Dawn, they're asking me again, how do we handle this situation? You know, and it's a lot of pressure on this one person that's employed in an organization to take all of that pressure on their shoulders. You know, and it is a case, as Dr. Kaneta was saying, where actually, some people have to just question themselves first, address what they're saying, and then come to the solution to themselves and say, look, would this help if I did this that way? Would this help if I questioned this person for you? Because that, that privilege, that white privilege works. You know, it works, otherwise, otherwise it wouldn't work, if you know what I mean. So you can use it for good as well as using it for just um, self-satisfaction. Okay, no, great. Thank you both for your, your, your remarks. I will now move on to the Q&A um, section. Of course, for those of you interested, please do send along your, your, your questions in the Q&A box. And I will begin um, poignant, of course, because of the title of this conversation being Race and Politics. Um, to you, Dawn, um, 
how can political representation be improved in areas where Bain communities feel unrepresented and polarized by manifestos or policies of, of, of I'm assuming all the political parties? Um, alongside that, it would be great if we could to, he to hear your thoughts on the question around racism being solely described as a white problem um and whether and what your what your comments are towards that question in the sense that um the questioner in this in this case has mentioned how there are of course differing forms of racism whether it be anti-semitism um and 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 other forms including the textile uh the textile workers controversy that took place in leicester which was people people of color um subjecting other people of color to to, to somewhat uh, um, oppression Therefore, it'd be great to hear your thoughts towards those two questions. Feel free to break it up since they are quite wide. Yeah, there's a, there's a load in there. Mm -hmm. So, um, first of all, um, so so because of what's happening, we're all reading different things and questioning different things and trying to put pieces together, not just so that um, to educate ourselves, but to also help us educate other people. So, I'm currently reading a book on race and caste. And, how, you know, because race is actually a social construct, so is caste a social, uh, a social construct. And actually caste came before, before race, because it was always a way of trying to keep, keep somebody else on top. So it's, all, it's always about the oppressor and those oppressed. So, so that is how that kind of, um, those kind of practices can happen in certain areas. But it doesn't cancel out racism. So what people try to do is they try to say, oh, yeah, this is a but, how about this? No, 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 there's no but. You know, people say, oh, yeah, you believe in Black Lives Matters and then send me videos of a black person doing something wrong. That doesn't cancel out the fact that Black Lives Matter. It doesn't cancel out the fact that there is racial discrimination. It doesn't cancel out the fact that there's discrimination against black people. Just because some black people might do some things wrong, it doesn't cancel out the fact that black people have been oppressed and enslaved for centuries. So people try and cancel things out with that argument, which actually makes, makes you part of the problem. You know, if you talk about like the grooming gangs, and, you know, they say, but there was a grooming gang of, of Muslim, um, and, you know, and paedophiles. Yes, all paedophiles are bad. Nobody's got to defend a paedophile. If you do, you're a sick person. But it makes you part of the problem if you think that is an acceptable part of an argument. It makes you part of the problem. So you need to question why you thought that was appropriate to bring that up when we're talking about discrimination. Because all it does, it takes us back instead of taking us forward. And what we're trying to do with the discussion is bring it forward. So um, so that that kind of tackles the, uh, the bit about, you know, the 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 um where you've got loads of people working in one place spreading a virus but the whole point the other thing is this is that you would think to yourself so people would say well why did they go to work if they were at risk of catching a virus working so close to somebody but that's the question you need to ask yourself with the fifth richest country in the world why are people going to work crammed in a workplace to try and make a living so they can eat and feed themselves why is that happen how did we get to that place so you have to ask yourself how did that happen why is that situation you know how comes we haven't got good, good working practices why are the trade unions not in there we need to ask ourselves that question why why has there been a, a systemic undermining of trade unions because trade unions are there to protect workers rights why don't you want workers to be protected why does there have to be this underclass of workers so um that answers that bit i think and i can't remember the other bits now that was like a six point question and i think <laughs> not at all not a problem at all um the other question was how can political representation be improved in areas where BAME communities feel underrepresented and polarized by by manifestos from different parties yeah so um, parties have to do a lot, lot better. I mean, Parliament was not designed for women. Parliament was not designed for black people. Parliament was not designed for people of colour. Parliament was definitely not ready for somebody like me. So, you know, Parliament is a place that was just there for white, upper class men who smoke cigars, who uh, most of them were lawyers, and after a day's work, they would go in, sit in a darkened room, puff on their cigar, and set a few laws 
you know, for the masses. And, you know, some of them still think that's their role. The only difference is you are not allowed to smoke inside. So, you know, we have to challenge all um, of that and understand that actually Parliament should be representative of the people that it seeks to serve. That means there should be somebody of every kind of ilk in Parliament. There should be more disabled people in Parliament. We haven't got a deaf person in Parliament. You know, there should be more, we should have a trans person in Parliament. Parliament should be more reflective of the society that it seeks to serve. If not, we won't hear those voices. And it's not to say that all voices are equal or the same or we are one homogenous group and all think alike. We don't. And that's why it's important that you don't just have one person. You know, you don't just have one person of colour around the table. Because if you have that one person of colour, you, you put too much pressure on that person. And that person then feels they might have to act a certain way to assimilate into, into the room, into the conversation, which might not reflect how they really think, or it might reflect what they think because of their background and their upbringing. And that's why it's important that you don't just have um, one person. But political parties are are way behind and needs to change. The Labour Party is better than all the other parties put together in terms of representation, but we still have a long way to go. I think the latest figure is that it takes that it will take another 150 years before we're truly represented. And I will be long gone by then, I'm sure. Um, let's hope we get there earlier then. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> um, no, no, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Canetta, um, Following up on, on, on the comments that were made earlier regarding um, white privilege and white denial and silence, what kind of tools and strategies do you think might work with regards to tackling this issue um, in different types of situations? And of course, you can speak towards your experiences having spoken out on this, especially with regards to academia. Alongside that, um, there, is, there is a question focusing on how the American, the American model of with regards to policing in America and the crisis in, in, in relations with regards to um, black communities in the, in the American and, and, and the UK and American leadership. Do you feel that there are general tendencies involving race and ethnicity are similar in the UK and the US? Or do you feel they're different having experienced both contexts, if you understand what I mean? Do you, does, does that question make sense? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to speak to it a little okay. bit. Um, so just to kind of start about some of the things, you know, just practical steps and think about, you know, what works. I do think um, there's a huge education component, um, you know, again, to kind of go back to, to my area, um, that it matters, you know, what uh, is taught in the curriculum. It matters whether or not students, um, there was an incredible uh, documentary on Channel 4 a couple of uh, weeks ago, um, the school that tried to end racism. It matters to begin introducing some of these concepts early on um, to, to think about how, you know, because one of the things that was really interesting about that documentary is that it was at work in the school, but the conversation went home to the parents. I'm sure it didn't end there. Um, you know, they were interacting with public spaces. So again, I think there's a, there's a big education piece. Um, we, we have to reckon with the multiracial, multicultural history of Britain as a nation that is sort of intimately connected to the history of Britain as an empire. We have to reckon with, you know, what didn't happen at abolition um, that, that set in motion the legacy of things that we're still dealing with. I mean, literally, we just paid the bill on, you know, compensation to slave owners in 2015. Like, come on. So, like, there's a real um, you know, reckoning with history that I think is really important. I also think, you know, again, alongside that point with what was what's happening in that documentary is that, you know, we do have to sort of invest in, and that's one of the things I do think that, that I am seeing more conversations around is investing in developing a kind of racial literacy, developing some 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 ability to talk more fluently about race and racism and to 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 name it in 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 particular kinds of ways and to understand it i mean one of the things that i always when i'm trying to talk about racism i'm, I'm also trying to tell people that racism is a proxy for understanding how power is operating it's really a conversation about power versus disempowerment and how that is happening um, and how we see that empowerment happening um, and that that can be a way into to certain kinds of conversation just to the point someone asked about 
different forms of racism. Yes, we can have um, different kinds of conversations about different forms of racism because again, you know, we're, we're mapping on different kinds of power relations. Now I do think, you know, with Black Lives Matter, part of what we, we are sort of trying to hold in view is a particular kind of conversation about anti-Black racism. However, what the demonstrations have shown us, what the visibility of this moment has shown us is that that's not an exclusive conversation. That's a conversation that, that can be the source of solidarities across racial, ethnic, religious, um, you know, ab ability lines, gender lines, all of those sorts of things. And I think about my own self as, you know, I, I'm not just black, I'm a black woman. Um, I'm, a, I'm a black woman, you know, with a particular kind of background. I'm a black woman that is not a citizen in this country. Like, you know, so all of those things have to be held in view at the same time. And we have to sort of think in a more robust way. And, and to Dawn's point about the kind of ways in which people sort of move to have these moves to kind of cancel conversations about race. Um, one of the things I think is a sort of a real way that it happens all the times in academia, but in public spaces is to use class and to sort of say, well, what about class? Um, as if, you know, um, that is, is, is precluding a conversation about race. Someone mentioned in the chat, uh, Stuart Hall. Stuart Hall basically said, you know, race is the modality in which class is lived. And so we cannot, you know, have robust conversations about socioeconomic inequality without attending to the different vectors by which those inequalities um, exist and persist. And again, race, gender, ability, sexuality, um, citizenship status, all of those things play into those conversations. So a conversation about Black Lives Matter is an open conversation that is going to, again, join up um, those kinds of solidarity. That's, that's definitely the kinds of things that we've seen in prior moments where you've seen other kinds of racialized communities build certain kinds of solidarities against capitalism, against um, the ways in which colonialism was working. And so, you know, those things and those abilities to form those coalitions and to actually deliver results is something that, you know, has happened historically. And again, those are, those are some of the things that I think that we can, um, that we can look towards um, in this moment. Just in terms of the, the last conversation, uh, the last point about similarities between the US and the, and the UK, I think, um, you know, one of the things I think, you know, that I think is, if, if we were having the conversation about policing, if, if we're looking at things, you know, from a data perspective in terms of representation in the criminal justice system, in some ways, it's a worse conversation in, in the UK in terms of the disproportionalities, in terms of the representation in certain aspects of the criminal justice system. I do think one of the things that, um, that, that can be distinctive is the role of gun violence and the sort of proliferation of guns in, in the US is, is something that's different. However, one of the things that I think um, George Floyd reminded us, reminded us of is that the issue of policing is about you know, the ability to exercise or feel you have the capacity to exercise violence without impunity, and that, that you know, you're not gonna be checked or anything like that. You know, that, that there is not going to be a firing, there is not going to be, there aren't going to be charges pressed. And again, that's a similar history in the UK, again, where we're seeing, you know, this history of unjust policing practices. And again, the ways in which um, there's no accountability, there's not even, you know, not charges not even brought. And so that ability to, to do those things and to sort of, you know, disregard um, black life and sort of not recognize um, people as human beings, I think is, is something that's very similar, but sometimes the ways in which that happens is can be different in these, um, in, in these two different settings, but nonetheless, the outcomes um, are, are still the same or, or very similar. Okay, great. No, thank you so much. Dawn, do you have anything to add from, from Dr. Kaneta's comment? No, I, was saying, I think somebody said that, um, that, that it, we're saying it's a white person's problem. And the thing is, is that well, I think that's also coming from a sense of uncomfortability where people are feeling, oh my God, you're saying it's, it's my problem or it's only you know, white people to blame. Um, it's not, but white people are part of the solution. And actually inaction is the environment in which racism grows and develops. And so if you are inactive in terms of not fighting racism as a white person, then you are allowing racism to, to flow and to grow. And so 
it's all of our problems to resolve it, but we can't do it without each other. And so, I, I mean, I read that there was somebody that wrote that thing to say like black lives matter. We're not saying that it's, it's only black lives matters. We're just saying black lives matter and we need your help to make sure that, you know, it's understood that black lives matter. At the moment, black lives don't matter as much as other lives. And so, so that's why we have this focus on black lives mattering. Okay, great. No, thank you so much for that, Dawn. Um, the question, um, a really, really interesting question at the bottom now. Curriculum reform conversations seem to focus solely on slavery instead of a broader understanding of black history and empire. Uh, whilst crucial, how can we encourage educators, especially when teaching history, to go beyond the slave and victim narratives um, for people of color? Maybe I'll start with yourself, Dr. Kernetta, and then move on to Dawn, if she has anything to add. Yeah, I mean, I think the conversation about curriculum reform needs to be joined up with a conversation about teacher education. Um, I think, you know, you know, teachers have been trained in, in an education system um, and trained to not do this work, to not talk openly about race. And I think that's a part of the kind of package that has to go along um, with, with that curriculum. What does it mean to introduce histories of enslavement in a classroom, um, you know, quite frankly, as a white teacher, perhaps in a classroom um, that may be dominated by students of color um, and students of African descent. And so like that dynamic alone is something that has to be attended to. It's, it's not about sort of, you know, shirking away from, from that. I do think, you know, again, I, I'm, you know, of the, 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 the persuasion that, again, I, I don't think we deal enough. I think we teach a history, there's a te the history that is taught about abolition. Um, and that's, that's what the history of slavery does is it, is it allows the British nation to become an abolitionist nation. And that's about as far as we get in terms of understanding that. But so I do think we still need to reckon with the realities of enslavement and the violence of colonialism and all those things that, you know, are again, we're still seeing the legacies of because I think they provide the important pretext and context for understanding the things that we're still grappling with in this, this current moment. Um, however, I do think it matters, you know, how we think about what it means to introduce those conversations and what it means to empower our educators to have the confidence to sort of, you know, engage in these conversations and to feel themselves, you know, to, to be able to open up those dialogues. So I think, again, I, I'm personally, you know, liking some of the campaigns, particularly one, one of the ones um, with running me the Teach Race, Empire and Migration, it's joined up with Yes, we need different content, but we also need to think about anti-racist pedagogy. We need to think about teaching practice that's also socially just and, and sort of, you know, bringing all of these things to bear. And again, I think thinking about teaching practice and thinking about social justice in our teaching practice will not just lend itself to having a curriculum that's more reflective of the society that we live in. It, it lends us to, you know, just, you know, having students who are thinking about all different kinds of injustices in society or all different kinds of ways that they might want to think about themselves as change agents. And so again, you know, having teachers that are sort of um, moving in that direction invites, I think, different kinds of conversations about what we really want our curriculum and what our education to actually do for people. And I think we want to raise people who are, or we want to educate people who are politically conscious, politically aware, able to decipher in this moment, you know, in our, in our, in our world where the gravity of information is all over the place, you know, how do you actually discern and distill and, and figure out what are legitimate arguments and things like that? So, you know, I think that's part of what, you know, the curriculum that we, we want to build. And that's more than just adding and stirring a couple of, you know, kind of themes or topics that are new, but it's about sort of really revisiting and thinking about, you know, the role of the classroom and, and kind of creating a certain kind of necessary civic and political education. And I think that's something that, that we've kind of gotten away from that I'm hoping that we were able to leverage this moment um, to, to think more about. And I think that's sort of related to one of the questions there, like how do we maintain momentum? How do we, you know, not let, um, let something just become a moment? And I do think it's a critical time to think about how do we leverage the visibility, how do we leverage the ways in which institutions um, 
people in positions of power are thinking differently about that and how do we you know make the case about sustainable change and what that looks like um, in our organizations and, and what we want to see um, moving forward. So I think that that definitely that's the work for I think people who are organizing around these issues to do is to really be clear about what in articulating what that vision um, can look like and, and what sorts of um, actions we think need to need to accompany that. Thank you so yeah, much. I mean, I think, yeah, the education is absolutely vital. It's absolutely pivotal to how we start changing things absolutely now. And if the government doesn't, I fought in 2006 to ensure that black history was part of the curriculum. Um, but what happened was, uh, for some reason, they thought black history was slavery, where, whereas actually slavery just interrupted a very rich African history. Um, and so uh, it's absolutely vital that history is taught, but not just history, the contributions of black people to society need to be taught because at the at the moment, how the curriculum is taught is that they it's it, what it does is it reinforces the idea that there's a group of people who are superior and another group of people who are inferior. And so that superiority, that privilege gets carried right from the very beginning because that's how you're taught at school. And there's like two things that I remember. So I remember Malcolm X had said, would you let your enemy teach your children? And that always resonated with me when I read that, because, you know, it's like, would you let your enemy teach your children? And that's that's essentially a part of what the the education was all about and why why the curriculum needs to change. But also Jen Elliott, she the day after Martin Luther King was assassinated, she she separated her class into blue eyes and brown eyes. And then she started that education program and she's still doing that now. And it's a really powerful, powerful work. And I just think, and you know, nothing, nothing is the solution in isolation, but education and teaching and school is absolutely vital that we are going to change people's thinking and also for, for children to develop critical thinking. Because if they can't do this critical analysis themselves, then there's an issue and a problem. If, if you're taught that everything in black is bad or wrong or inferior, can you imagine when you find out that actually that black child came to school was way more intelligent than you when they started school, but actually it's the system that held them back. Can you imagine what that does to your mental health? So it's really important that, um, that the curriculum is changed. I think education is a, is a beautiful uh, topic to begin to conclude with. Um, I think, um, just as you've mentioned in particular, I think I imagine as someone who grew up in Britain, went to a state school, the, the first encounter that we have with slavery refers to William Wilberforce discounting all of the other black abolitionists that existed throughout history. And, and I think slavery is probably, like you said, the, the only black history you end up learning, which of course begins a inferiority complex for those of us that are interested in, 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 in of course, um, excelling within, within different, uh, of course, historical or, or otherwise. Um, I think now we'll probably begin to, to conclude and I'd love to op offer you both the opportunity to provide uh, closing remarks. Um, and maybe just, to, just a small thing from my side in the sense that corporations, political parties, universities have all, some would say, jumped on a bandwagon because you can commercialize Black Lives Matter, you can commodify it, it's something that's cool, it's hip, and it allows you to gain that social capital um, within your own industries. Um, what are the tangibles? What, are, what is allyship? How, how do individuals, institutions, corporations manifest allyship into, the, into their uh, ways of working and their institutions themselves? And, and of course, any other closing remarks you may have, I will start with Dr. Canetta. Okay, um, I'll just sort of say about the, the statements. Um, I, you know, a lot of people I easily will dismiss them and I get it. Like a lot of, you know, I think that, that there is something very performative about, you know, uh, the virtue signaling that is happening with that. However, um, there's a way in which those statements are also going to become a blueprint for accountability. Um, you know, I can, I, I can, I know in organizations examples of, you know, staff members who are paying attention to what these, these organizations are putting out in terms of their position there. And they're going to have, they're going to use their own words against them. Um, whereas these statements might've been sort of, you know, 
put together under certain kinds of conditions, you know, there are going to be ways in which, you know, you're going to be held accountable to, to those statements. So I think there's still, the, even those things that might buy, you know, have come out from, you know, sort of been designed to do a particular kind of work, they do become ways for communities to make certain kinds of claims. And we've seen that historically, like the notion of citizenship is about, you know, what certain people who were oftentimes denied the privilege of citizenship demanded that it become. Um, and so, you know, and it, it was, there were policies and there were laws that shifted in, in, in response to those demands. So I, I don't discount that as, as well. I think in terms of, you know, what next in terms of organizations, one of the things that I, you know, you know, would encourage organizations to do to show and really demonstrate action on these things is to really, you know, just even from a kind of beginning kind of representational piece, it is about sort of looking in the mirror and sort of thinking about, you know, what do our smart objectives need to look like? What are some things that, you know, we can look at our boardrooms, we can look at our spaces where the decisions are being made. What do we need to re-examine about the processes that have gotten us to spaces where it doesn't represent the people who are on our staff, where it doesn't represent the customer base that we're serving or the, the communities that we're serving. And so I think, you know, those are some, some really kind of concrete, actionable things that you can look at. And you can sort of say, if your boardrooms are all white or, or lack um, racial and ethnic diversity, you can set some benchmarks around that. And then you, the equalities law actually does allow for positive action. When you see that kind of underrepresentation, you can move in, in directions to actually remedy um, those disproportionalities that exist there. And so you can set those things as targets. And when people at the top do that, that they possess a lot of power to make the organizational culture follow. And so I do think that there are um, some real practical steps that particularly um, um, those in positions of power are now asking and being asked and, and can, can do that can really begin to shift um, the tone of certain kinds of organizational cultures. Dawn? Uh, yeah, so I think um, what, what we can do is for people who have privilege and position, and that's everyone that has a privilege and position, I have a position, to use that for good, to use that for change, and to use that to make yourself feel uncomfortable. So get out of your, your comfort zone, feel some, do something that makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable. You know, you may be around the boardroom table and they might be saying something that doesn't resonate, maybe isn't true. Or there is, as Dr. Kinetis has said, nobody um, of color around the table. Raise it around the table. Make yourself feel uncomfortable just for that moment. Because, you know, black people feel uncomfortable every single time we walk into a room almost. So for that moment, you know, make yourself feel uncomfortable. What we have to do is ensure that while companies are listening, that that listening is turned into active listening and is also turned into action. So we have to link that to key performance indicators so that you know that their progress uh, has a direct relation to how much they get paid. Because a funny thing happens when you link performance to money and change, you know, people get it done a lot quicker. It becomes less of a talking shop and more of a how can we get that done? When can we get that done? So it needs to be linked to um, KPIs. And, and I would say um, make room. Uh, so it's not about, um, I'm not asking people to, to, to remove themselves from the table and allow somebody to sit at that table. That table is big enough. Make room for somebody else to be at that table. And those are, that's when we start to see change because until we get systemic change, until we start changing the structures, we're only going to see small incremental changes. So I don't just want to see another person around the table. I want to make sure that the system is designed in such a way that nobody's going to be prevented from sitting around that table again. And that's why I think this is our moment now. So our moment is not about incremental changes. It's not about a little bit or the one person. It's about the system. How do we change the system? So first of all, we can have a quick change, right? We get someone around the table and then how do we change the system? Because without that, we'll be back here again, uh, the next generation and another 10 years we'll back, uh, back here again. And I don't think any of us wants that. And the other thing that I think is really important in this time is that we've got generations of people all fighting together. So before it was maybe one generation. Now we've got 
three or four generations all fighting together, all fighting for the same thing. And it's not just one group of people. And because of that, it's a powerful base. It's a powerful foundation. And because it's so powerful, we can see change as long as we don't give up and we focus on dismantling the system and the structural barriers and the systemic racism that exists in society. Thank you so much, Dawn. And uh, thank you actually to both of you, uh, Dr. Kaneta Perry um, and Dawn Butler MP for your incredible remarks throughout this meeting. I've learned a lot and I'm assuming, I can, I can only assume that our audience has also learned huge amounts. Um, this is a discussion that um, I have been really, really honored to host. Um, I can only once again, thank you and thank you to our attendees. Um, all of this information and this video will be available on Chatham House website after um, to watch and uh, of course to disseminate amongst your networks. Um, I can only end by saying this is a struggle that uh, like Dawn has just said is generational and we each and every one of us has a responsibility to, to, to contribute towards it. Um, generations to come we will be asked about what we did when this moment came up. I hope each and every one of us in this call and those watching on the live stream can say proudly that we contributed and were on the right side of history and contributed towards working and, and establishing a world where regardless of your racial identity, your ethnicity, that you're able to contribute and do all you can um, without any barriers in front of you. Thank you so much and goodbye. Thank you.